Welcome to episode 141 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Kyle Faulkner from The View about their latest album, Exorcism of Youth. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Scott McCoy from The Baseball Project about their fourth studio album, Grand Salami Time. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform Give us a rating and leave a comment. The View return after a five-year hiatus with their brilliant new album, Exorcism of Youth, their first album since 2015. In this interview, Kyle Faulkner talks about recording the album in Spain with legendary producer Youth. We talk about upcoming live shows, his solo work, family life, and lots more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Kyle Faulkner from The View. So hi Kyle, welcome back to the Access Noise podcast. How's it going man? Not too bad, how are you? Yeah good, I have just been, I've had the premiere of my musical on in Edinburgh uh, the past couple of days and then I was playing up in the north, the northest of northest of Scotland, um, I'm supposed to be doing these like Q and A things where um, I just do a bit of talking about my songwriting, and um, but there was there was three crashes on the road on the way up, so um, I ended up getting in. At, like, I never went on the station twelve o'clock at night, and everyone was well on their way by then, so I didn't think it was a. I tried to like play a couple of my news, talk about new things, but I think people were just wanting some hits. So I ended up just doing like a big mad set and I ended up playing to two in the morning and it was pretty crazy. So <laughs> yeah, it took me like 11 hours to get there from, and I just got a camper van. So I thought, I'll just go and do it. I, I won't need a tour manager or that. I'll just go and do it with my mate. And it was like the, the journey from hell. But it was good, man. It was it was a beautiful drive, but it was a, but it was a hard one. Well, good. Hopefully we'll get into your songwriting. But first, I'd like to go back to the start. Can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? I was really into like, as a kid, I was into like West Side Story and Greece and stuff. I loved, I loved musicals because my dad was kind of into that. But then, I think the first person I actually loved was Michael Jackson. I was totally obsessed with him when I was a kid. Um, that kind of dominated my life until Eminem, and then it was Eminem, and then Oasis, and the Beatles. The Beatles. When we got to the Beatles, that was like, okay, this is, this is my. The, I, I gave up on everything and just like the the Beatles were like my gods. It was like my Bible and everything that changed my life. Did you ever meet Paul McCartney? I have. I've met him once before. He came to a show I was playing with Mark Ronson. I used to tour with Mark all the time and um, he came to the show that we were playing in the Roundhouse and he put me on the guest list for the show the next night. Um, but yeah, it was pretty crazy. I had to, that was a very emotional time for me. Because I was with like Sabine Boys and uh, this band, the, the Feeling, I can't remember, but they were like, they were all kind of eating this chili. <laughs> I was like, I was like, McCartney's in the room, whatever, he just comes up, and you're just m- munching on chili. And they were like, oh, he's now loads of times. I was like, I feel my respect, boys. And <laughs> like, came up and he was like, oh, nice to meet you. And he had like somebody whispering in his ear. Like, and he was going, oh, yes. He was like, oh, yeah, I saw you. Uh, your name's Kyle. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. But I think he just had so like, and, uh, so, and someone telling him like who's everyone's names were and that because he's Paul McCartney he doesn't have to remember your name not my name anyway but yeah it was, it was pretty cool man that was the first time I'd saw him live as well so it was pretty cool it's funny you mentioned Greece I actually showed the film Greece to, to my 14 year old daughter last night Um, it was the first time she'd ever seen it and she loved it oh class yeah I think it was, it was six or seven the first time I've seen that I've seen that a million times but like on the on the theatre I've seen it in Spanish a few times as well it was kind of weird though, because I used to kind of speak Spanish in school, and now I've kind of stopped. Even though I've got a house over there, I've started to speak less Spanish now than I used to. I used to be able to go and see a musical in, in, in Spanish and understand it. Now I'm like, what the hell are they on about? Weird, man. Uh, it's such amazing songs in the film. They're absolutely brilliant. Yeah, unreal, man. Hopelessly Devoted like one of my favourite songs ever. Yes, yes, it is. I agree. Love it. It's amazing. Yeah, man. Your first solo record, No Thank You, came out in 2018 and then No Love Songs for Laura in 2021. What did you learn from the experience of being a solo artist that you took into working with The View again? Well, it was more like when I when I started doing the solo stuff, I'd, I'd craved to do it for so long. Um, 
want to put some on stuff. I want to see what it would be like just enough to answer to anybody. And you know, it was it was good. It was a bit of a weird one because I intended on producing myself, but when I went into the studio with this guy Charles, Charles, I can't, I can't, I can't remember his second name, but he's like Paul Weller's engineer. So when I came in, I was like, I'm going to produce it myself. But then when I was asking him, like, oh, could you help me with this? He was like, no, you're producing it. He says, I'm an engineer unless you give me that title. And I was like, no, nah, I'll just do it myself. So I learned the hard way how to do it. I mean, I've, I've co-produced a lot of things with Owen Morris. Like when I'm doing stuff with youth, I'm always, I'm, I'm always hands-on. I'm the guy that's up to like to 10, 10 a.m. the next day and still working on it and going away and working. And I'm, I'm really hands-on. I've always been into the production side, but... When I went in to do it on my own, I didn't have any help at all, and I'm not very technical with stuff. So, but I got it done. You know what I mean? And it felt good. I think that's something I've always wanted to do: produce and not have. I think like having a tour all the time was. I was expecting to not have to. I was expecting the pressure to be off a bit when I was because of the shows were a bit smaller, and the the one so the tours weren't so extensive. But I mean. Sometimes it was just uh, just always non-stop touring with a few. Um, and I liked it when I was younger. But, I mean, you got older and it's like, and I just had a kid, so I thought I need to try and just chill a bit. But funnily enough, nowadays I'm just like, it's the busiest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm just never, I'm never home. So whenever I'm home, I'm always trying to take, take the kids on, like, big, <laughs> to make up for it, take them on lavish trips. And they're like, we just want to chill in the house. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, we're going in the camper van for a month to Europe. And I'm, like, I'm just like, and shouting my head off trying to get directions where I'm going but I think with the, with the view um, we all kind of got a bit fed up of doing the same routes same tours I mean because we it was all kicking off when we were doing America and stuff at the start and then we, never, we weren't allowed back in there for a bit so when we came when we got back in it was like we weren't as big as we were used to be because when we first went to America we were selling out like massive venues so it was a bit like a kick in the stones we're like oh no we've got to kind of start again in America so I thought, let's just go and have a wee break. And everyone was doing their own thing anyway. Pete's playing for Echo and the Bunnymen. Kieran wanted to do a, um, a university course. So it was the right time to do it. But um, you, missed the, you missed the camaraderie. And, and like with, a, with my solo band, I'm just constantly changing it because people have got jobs, other jobs, whereas the view was, that was our job. You know what I mean? So with, with the solo stuff, it was just like, well, he's like, I can't do this week, so I'd have to go and train up another like another guitarist for like three week rehearsal. Now. So it was a bit of a pain in the arse. But last man, I think being back with a view, we're just um, we've got we've got a new drummer. Everything feels really fresh. Um, we've got a new album, but funnily enough, we've not even rehearsed the album up yet, and we've got all these in stores and out stores coming up. So <laughs> we're going to get a move on. Um, but it's hard. You no, know I mean it's summer holidays for me. I've got three kids. So I need to do as much as I can for that because I'm always away. So I'm like, I need to get a time at a hearse, but I'm sure we'll be fine, man. Well, as you said, the viewer back with your sixth studio album, Exorcism of Youth, after being away for five years. It's an absolute banger. So why was the time right now for a new view record? Well, I actually started chatting about it a couple of years ago, well, even three, maybe four years ago. Because I think I think maybe we've not played in five years but the, the the last album was a long time ago I think it was like 2015 maybe 60 I can't remember but we were like uh, I think we met with new managers and they were like let's just we were like when could this happen he said well you've got you've actually got a record deal that's sitting waiting so it was just because it was in our contract so we thought well why not just use it it was a good record deal as well so obviously we've been away for a while so we had more songs than we knew what to do with as well so I just felt the right thing to do and working with youth again, like we've, we've done an album with youth in 2011, Bread and Circuses. <clears throat> and he was like, on, oh, and before they wouldn't let me into the, he wouldn't let us in his place in Spain because he thought we'd run riot. He was like, oh, he says we wouldn't do any work because we'd just be like, want to get smashed all the time. So I think, hence the name of the album, The Exorcism of Youth. I mean, that's like a, a double meaning because we felt like we were maybe grown up enough to now go to youths and not, not get wasted. We did have a good time. But um, we, we, the, the work, we got the work done, you know what I mean? So it was like, we were doing that and had weekends off. We'd done it for about a month. And we wanted to call the last album that, but we never we ended up not doing it because it was funny. But Youth actually does like wee mini exorcisms and he's, <laughs> he's sauna and stuff. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, <laughs> get ready your demons and that. It's pretty, pretty trippy times. It's good, man. Yeah, Youth, you know, he's a legend. He's, he's produced some amazing albums. Um. 
So what 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 did he bring to the table? And I know you really enjoyed working with him on bread and circuses, but did he was there anything different this time around? I felt like youth had more uh, more um, more time for us. I think obviously we've grown up. Um, when we first went to the studio the last the first time, it was like what he had to tell all oh, you you've got to be sober and and we kind of felt like he was a bit more of a dad. We used to call him dad actually. <laughs> and this one, I felt like we were more. We're, 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 we've known him for years, but I think we're kind of, kind of we're pals now. You know what I mean? We weren't just like I think we were twenty year olds when we done the last records, and he's. So I felt like there was more respect for each other, and obviously we were in his house, and I don't know. He's, he's, you've got you've you you just put you've got you put a lot of trust in him, um, and you get you get the results because a lot of people. If they try and tell you what to do with your songs that you've been working on for years, then some guy just comes up and goes, "No, that's terrible. Take take this, take the BPM down like fifteen, and you're like, like, no, no way. But youth, you just put a bit of trust in them, and it, it pays off. Your lyrics, are all, they're often they often capture the the essence of everyday life. They're always observational, witty, and insightful. What inspires your your songwriting process? Well, me and Kieran are, are different. Um, Mine, I think we work different. I think we write about different stuff. I think Kian's more political. Um, I'm more like sort of dreamy, and um, sometimes, sometimes it takes me like a a while to see what I've actually even written. And I'm like, whoa! And like that. Hence, when we done when we done the No Love songs, when I done that No Love songs album, I showed my missus all the songs, and she was like, "This is basically about our struggles, what I've been going through." And I, but I didn't realize what I was writing about. It was just coming off the tongue. So I try not to look into it too much, and then after I'll go like, holy, holy shit, that's pretty deep. Um, so normally the, the melody will come, and I'll get the hook of the song, and I'll leave it. I'll just like sort of let it sit for ages, and then I'll wait till I come into the to the studio, and I'll just I'll basically say I've got this new song. Once I've got the verse and the chorus down, I'll then go away and write the the next verse. It's always different. This time it was like, I mean, I've got obviously that I do a lot more songwriting than I used to, so I've got like. I used to just do an album and then I wouldn't really touch another song for like till the next album and until the label would be like, we need a new album. So I'd go, right, okay, I need to go and write again. But um, because I've got the songwriting camp in Spain and I've got, I'm working with a lot more producers and the different songwriters and I'm just so, it becomes easier as you get, you get older and the more you do it, it becomes like, I mean, I write a lot on the piano now as well, whereas I never used to, everything was on a guitar. And I think, obviously oh, being not, not a great piano player, but I could still play it. That's good to not have to. I think well, I'm more of a busker when I play guitar and piano. I could just play things if I to hear it. But I think sometimes if if I was really good, and I, this is no excuse, but if I was a really good guitarist or whatever, and or a producer, or if I was like an engineer, and you know, like you get some people that are like techs. That's something that I've never really been interested in. It's just like just get done what I need, and I think that's really important as a songwriter. Just keep doing your craft, but also. Don't overthink it. You know what I mean? Some and all always whatever lyrics roll off the tongue, I always go right. It's like when Paul McCartney wrote yesterday, he was writing scrambled eggs. Oh baby, I love your legs. And like they just write whatever comes out first, and then I'm going, what a word of shite. And then like by the time you finish the song, you're like, oh, the lyrics are actually pretty good. <laughs> you know what I mean? It always happens. <laughs> so I think like yeah, just trust the process, man. Well, there's so many great tracks on the album. Let's let's talk about some of them. Um, when you're in the studio. Was there a particular song that, that just arrived and you thought, right, we're on the right track now? Yeah. Um, we didn't really know what kind of sound we were wanting. And when our managers came in and the label and stuff were like, we showed them the songs. They're like, oh, it's euphoric. It's, it's rock. It's, it's pop. It's like, uh, I think I think when we done a song, it feels like um, that was cool because there's a guy we we'll work with, Michael Randall as well, who's like youth sort of understudy. And he was like, what do, you, what do you want to sound like? And I was like, well, I don't know. He's like, well, what are you listening to? I was like, I listen to a lot of the killers. I was listening to a bit of Sam Fender at the time. Um, but, I mean, I'm always quite old school with what I listen to. I just listen to the same stuff and the same Beatles albums. And, like, I always think, like, if you listen to new music all the time, it's that, it, yeah, it puts you off a wee bit. Like, you're like, oh, I don't really want to sound like that. It's got to stay, stay true to your sound. Um, but I think Feels Like was cool because... That was another song that was just written like I was at my mates and it's the melody came and I just like I sang it and then just the chorus came straight away and the verse was 
it'll happen really quick. And then I just told the band, I said, I've got this song. And even while I was playing it to youth, I was writing it. So it was like, all them bits were kind of written on the spot. Because if, and then the middle eight parts and everything, it was just, uh, I, I felt like there was, there was something magical about that song. Um, and Kian, Kian had a song, he's got a song, um, Shovel in His Hands, which was really cool. It was cool to see how that, how the sound collectively started to come around because when Kian, if you hear Kian's demo, it was more like uh, Jesus and Mary Chain. And then it, when, once we got the production and I'm all, because Kian was originally singing it, so I was playing the bass. Um, because when we were, but that's how the bait, that's how it turned into a kind of choral kind of song, like sort of six days, six days garage rock or something. Um, so that was me, that was cool to see how that went about because when I was playing the guitar and Kieran was playing the bass and he was trying to want me to sing it, but then you said, like, Why don't Kieran, Kieran sing it in the bit? And everyone always thinks that's Kieran singing, but it's me. But he was like, Well, try and keep it close to the way I was doing it. So then it was, it's got this whole mix of like the choral and like. <laughs> like Jesus and Mary Chain or some mad stuff. It was really weird, but yeah, it was cool to see how that goes around. Because uh, yeah, I, I like it when Kieran sings the songs because it gives me a break when we're on stage live. Uh, I think Wall decided just for me to do it, but which which changed the vibe of the song. It was more like spoken before, which is cool because you see how you see how that happens. There's some some other stuff where I mean Kieran uses a lot of, like grunge, like pedals, like um, like a lot he's obsessed with these. Those pedals, these big big things, and I'm all I'm always a bit. Oh, I'm not sure about that. And then once 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 it's on, it's like oh, that's that made that made it some cool. You know what I mean? Um, so I suppose on paper it wouldn't doesn't work sometimes, but when you get in the room and you've got a good producer and everyone and Kieran's got songs, I've got songs. Pete wrote a really good song called uh, uh, "Allergic to Mornings" as well, which was class. And even then, he'd been away with Echo and the Bunny Man for like maybe he's been with them for four or five years. And you could tell his influence by that by that band and just spend a lot of time with Mac, you know what I mean? He's like <laughs> turned into this like pure gothic prince. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty cool. I just seen them lyrics, seen Pete develop as a writer as well, because even years ago Pete would have even wanted to show you his songs. And now he's he's just come right out. He's 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 absolutely brilliant and he's writing all the time. So everyone's got a bit of competition to see who can get on the album. But this one we had what load what about seven songs and that never made it and about ten songs that never even got recorded because they never had time, and that was that was like a month, maybe five weeks in, a few weeks off, and then back in for another three weeks. So that was a lot of time recording as well, but a lot of effort goes into it. Man. My favorite track on the album is Footprint, "Footprints in the Sand." That there and Arctic Sun, two builders. Yeah, man. I think so. Uh, Footprints in the Sand was a uh, was Kian's song, which was. Kind of, that was another one. We were we had drums on it, and we were playing it like sort of old school view, and it wasn't really connecting. We were, we were the, then we, we thought, wait, let's let's go and try and like sort of. I think there were referenced Stranger Things, you know, like the TV show, and we were like, well, let's try and make it like that kind of vibe. And that's another side. That's Kian's political writing coming through all that stuff. Um. So yeah, you've got to do. It. I've got to do a good job of that when he's. He's asking me to sing one of them songs because he, he feels strongly about it. You know what I mean? Whereas I'm not very a political person. I don't even go on Instagram. I don't have, don't read the news. I don't have a don't have a television. I, I've got a Netflix for the kids, but I try and stay away from it because I tend to get to get pretty down when I when I read random shit. And, it, and my message is always like, "Yeah, you need to got kids. You need to care for it." I said, "No, you do that. I'll just keep away from it. You know what I mean, it's no good for my for my mental health." So. Yeah, the whole record's class, I love it. Arctic Sun's just old school, the view, you know, it's uplifting. You know, it's good sing along chorus. Yeah, man, I love it. I think, I think we're going to need to get all these all these songs rehearsed up as well. But Arctic Sun, yeah, was always one of my favourites. Um, he's uh, That was about a guy that we used to go to school with that died, one of our friends. Um, he was a beautiful soul. Um, it's quite emotional singing that song, actually. Hopefully that's received well, you know what I mean? It's like, um, I think the last record that we have done with the view, what was it, the Rope Walk, that was, that was like an example where we let the producer run amok and I wasn't really in, in control of it. It was Albert Hammond Jr. was doing it and it was like, what all these songs, like what, 50 songs or something and we rehearsed up 25, ready to go. Then Albert Hammond was like, no, I, I want to try that. I want to try, have you got any voice notes? So we sent him 
of just random songs and then we've edited all these songs together to make that album which was a bit annoying because that's not the way we wanted it to sound but we were thinking it's one of our heroes we love the stroke so we'll just need to let him go but but it was one of our most critically acclaimed albums done well but just there were songs that I just didn't even want to tour on that like just want to play in the live set so this one feels a lot different this album feels like these songs are actually shut up so and I'm not I'm not I'm not shit like scared to say that because they are you know what I mean it's like I think just like pop, pop rock bangers, it's like you can't go wrong. Good songs, man. The band go on tour in the autumn, and before that, you're out doing some solo shows. So, are you looking forward to getting back out on the road? Oh, I kind of was. <laughs> I was, and then I just done that the couple of gigs up in Wick and lost him out, and it really put me off. I was like, fuck. Right. But yeah, no, obviously, no, I love going on tour. It'll be good going with a view. And also, this is one of the biggest tours that we've done. Since, since a long time, um, because what I was honest, like, we took like weekends off and stuff, um, or no, like we took like a few days off here and there, so it's not just like every day and then like a day off. It's like so we've got like thirty odd dates in the tour, so it'll be interesting to see how we could cope with that. But um, I think that's when you learn your trade again, because we've not I've not done a tour like that either in years, so that'll be where we'll actually proper learn the songs because there's bits. Even when you're in a rehearsal room, you're basically just learning the parts. But it's not until you're on stage and you see the action and you start doing it and then you start giving the song more and then, you, then it turns into something else. And then what happens a lot as, as well is the songs turn into like, you do parts where you go, oh, no, shit, I should have, I should have actually sung it like that on the record because you become, when you're in recording, you don't know what's going on. You're just like trying to like write the song and like put it in. And then when, when, once you actually play it live and then you start doing like this wee bit and you're like, ah, you're like, oh, that's class, man. I should put it down. But yeah, I, no, I can't put it on tour, man. It's going to be good. Um, I have to ask you about this. In May, you and, you and Kieran have a bit of an altercation at the Deaf Institute in Manchester, which you've since apologised for. What happened? Is everything okay now? Oh, yeah. I don't really want to say much about that. It. It's more of a personal thing, but um, it's uh, we've been through worse than this. It's just because somebody, somebody's filmed it. It was a, a personal thing that was going on with us. Um, but yeah, we've made up. Um, the whole band's been through through everything. But I mean, yeah, we we'll, we'll both apologised. It's fine. That was just uh, but not everything what you see on, you know, on the camera is like it looks uh, uh, it's bad. You know, it's, but uh, also there was other stuff going on. So I used to be in. I, I used to kind of when you travel with people that that much. It used to happen all the time. Um, even in school, we went to the same nursery, primary, everything. And uh, so to have always, but well, we know how to, we know how to make up. You know what I mean? It's like it takes a while, but it's 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 okay. Uh, I'm not saying it's okay doing that, but I'm just saying it is. And um, there was other stuff going on. Yeah. Apart from the new album, if you were to recommend one of the view albums to someone who had never heard the band before, what album would you tell them to start with? Um, I don't know. I do. I, do, I like them all, to be honest. Um. Bread and Circus it seems to get the best um, the best reaction. Obviously, we had the biggest hits from from um, Hats Off to the Buskers, but Bread and Circus, I felt like that was, if we had made that record, if we had made that, we had made Witch Bitch with that producer, with the youth, it would have been, it would have been more successful, but we're, just, we're on a riot on that Witch Bitch album. They're great songs, but the recordings are a bit, bit wacky because we're, we're kind of away with it all the time. Uh, it felt like that was the right thing to do at the time because we were like number one all over the world and we were like young and we got money thrown right in our faces and we we're just like and Owen Morris kind of I felt like he took the piss a wee bit because he, like, he, he knew that that was our shot to keep going we could have had massive hits but even the title Witch Bitch it was like that was we got advised not to call it that but it was like because it's like because derogatory or whatever but we weren't meaning like that it was actually the the original album was was a picture of Maleficent Maleficent with, with no face so it was like she's a witch bitch but then the label actually wrote witch bitch and we're singing it as in as in as in then we kind of went with that and then it was like oh you can't say that and it was like so then we just stopped playing on the radio and, and all this shit and it was like oh by the time you're like who cares man it's okay it's rock and roll and it was like but now it'd be like oh that's a stupid mistake but the band we were quite we were quite stubborn back then we would just say it's our album we'll do what we want. And the label, like, we're advising you not to do this. And it was like, ah, fuck off. 
So, yeah. <laughs> if I wanted to make a playlist of the best songs by The View, help me out. What are the five songs I should have on there? Superstar Jasmine, Wasted Little DJs, Same Jeans, that's a good song, um, Grace, and Shock Horror. Well, great choices. I would I would personally have the clock on there. I think it's it's my favorite song by the view. It's, I love it. Oh yeah, I love that as well. Yeah, I love the clock. Yeah, it's class. Yeah. Cheers, man. And, and same jeans, you know, it, it's your still your most streamed song on Spotify. It still resonates yeah. with so many people. Yeah, well, I think it was that was a it was a it was a crazy time when that song was out and I think it remembers people of like good times before all this PC stuff and like you were able to have fun without getting in trouble and um, but before people were scared of getting videoed all the time on their phone, <laughs> but I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, even for years, like, because we were that's all we were associated with that song, and then for, for ages, for a while, we were just like, no, we're not going to play that song anymore live. And then we were like, why are we not playing that song live? It's brilliant. And then we started playing it again, we're like, oh, shit, we should have been playing that for years. But yeah, I think everyone that has a, has a monster hit like that are always like, um, always don't want to play it because like, I'm better than this I'm better than this one song but it's, you kind of deny it it's a great song if I was at one of your shows and you didn't play it I would be very disappointed <laughs> yeah, yeah. The hard way, yeah just a few more questions Kyle I like to ask my guests the following questions if you could, if you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career what would it be the f- one, one time when we were playing at Glastonbury um, I think it was the first time we played actually we were on second last, so second from headline, on the pyramid stage, on the main stage. And we, me and Kieran were going around playing with different bands that day. I played with Sunshine Underground, The Horrors, Mumra, and we were basically getting fucked up the whole day. And the show was atrocious. Like, Pete's lying on the floor, like, thinking he's Jimi Hendrix. And, like, I'm just, like, away with the fairies, like, trying to do, like, these crazy harmonies. Kieran's just buzzing off his tits and, like, I was just like, oh, but that was where that was where chance to shine. <laughs> Didn't give a fuck. So I would probably go and, I, I, but it was still a great time. I remember seeing frisbees and lights and just being like, wow, I can't believe we're putting it like second from headline at Glastonbury. It was like it was a big, big moment. But I think I would go and do that better because that was the that funnily enough that was the only festival that that we weren't phenomenal on. Everyone, every other one when we're headlining Tina Parks and all these rock nesses and everything, we were nailing it and like going on later than that. But just that one, we got carried away, and I think it was there were probably the most critics and everything like that. And we just kind of confirmed that we we're just a bunch of little dicks. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I would just go and go and fix that up a wee bit. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, for us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? Like, even though I, n- I never got into it till a wee bit later, but um, probably like definitely, definitely, maybe. Like Oasis, or or what's the story? They're like still when they come on, I feel like I'm just in the moment, loving it. And obviously, when the when the view started, like we were, we got to play a couple of big gigs, Oasis and stuff, and some moments in time. Massive, massive Oasis fan. What song or album is your guilty pleasure? I mean, I was at a couple of a couple of things, and I was at like a a guy, the guy promoter's house the other night, and I had a YouTube party, and I was just like. It's not even because I've got kids. I'm just obsessed with Disney songs, um, like part of, part of this world and all that stuff. Like part of that world, even like uh, Ariel, like singing. That's like one of my. I think they're like the best constructed songs ever. I love them. I love musical stuff. Um, I love Milan. I love I love, I love every Disney film, and so I love all the songs of them. But yeah, like to the point that it was like, it was just emotionally like just the other day. I was like, oh, driving for so long. I was like. And I thought I finished the gigs and I have to go back the next day. And I said, like, Oh my God, it was already like stupid o'clock in the morning. I was like, Which one do I have to put this song on? I was like, Oh my God, it's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's definitely got the pleasure. Sir. You've been famous for a long time now. What's the stupidest thing you've ever bought? Um, I mean, I bought like, I bought a caravan one time and then sh- shot it. I, I got bought, I bought a BB gun and I was doing rehearsal, doing a. Target practice and thinking nothing of it, and it was the bullets were going through. No, it wasn't a real gun; it was a BB gun, but it was a strong one. 
and the bullets were going through every wall on the caravan every day. <laughs> so I woke up the next day and it was like there was just there was just there was just all holes in all the caravan. It was just shining through from all the bits. Felt pretty stupid after doing that because um, it was just sitting up on there and I'm getting pushed. I bought this big like six foot devil before off of off a of legend, you know the film legend. Yeah, yeah. I bought it from a comic book store, and it was like my mascot on uh, when we were recording which bitch. But yeah, I bought a lot of stupid things, man. Toys. I buy toys and lose them. Every, I bought like every Tim Burton character that's ever been in his movies. I used to collect them when I was going around the world. And I left them in a, and I had them in big black bags that had like maybe a hundred or the hundred of these figures. And I left them at the airport and I phoned that somebody had taken them. I was like, what do you mean? You can't just take things to the airport. And I was like, nah, somebody, somebody ran away with them. So I was gutted about that. I was thousands and thousands of pounds worth of stuff. But hey ho. What are you most grateful for about being able to do what you do every day? Um, I think my kids appreciate it. Like my kids are always, they're always chuffed. Like when I go and pick them up from school and that, they're like, "There's my dad." Um, and I mean, it's you know, I, even though I'm, I complain about it a lot, I'll be away for a couple of weeks at a time. But when I'm back, I probably get them to spend more time with the kids and somebody that does a day to day job. But. The older they're getting, the harder it's getting to be away from them. But I do get to spend more time with them than anyone else, and hopefully they're they're going to be musicians as well. Um, because I would definitely advise them to do it because you get to travel the world and everything's just amazing. So, but yeah, and no, I think a lot of people kind of kind of stand this kind of job or it gets to them, and it does get to me as well. I mean, just being away all the time, but it's worth it. And I think it's good for the kids to know that. I mean, my my mum was a cleaner, and my dad was like retired, but like worked in like a, a battery fa- and a tire factory. So it was like, I think they would they they're both dead now. But I think it, I think because then they they went to work every day, and then at night they would go out with their mates, and then we'd get a babysitter. So it was like I barely saw them anyway. You know what I mean? But then if but if they were away to like my dad used to go to Scotland games for like a couple of days at a time, and they'd be like, oh, I miss my dad and that. But I go away for a couple of weeks, and the girls didn't even phone me. I'm like, why are you not phoning me? And they're like, you're away all the time. It's fine. We know you're working. I'm like, come on. So, yeah, it's good. I mean, it's, and the girls, it's always pretty exciting what we're doing. We're always in the camper van someplace or out there place in Spain. And there's always different musicians going around. I'm always working with other artists. So it's good for them to see that. Um, so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I've got three healthy kids and just like, and they understand the business I'm in and, they get it and they're not they're not like sad that I'm away. They're just they're totally fine because they've got a good mum, so they're fine, you know what I mean? But yeah. No, I remember one of the last times I spoke to you, Wild was just born, and now you have another two. Yeah. Yeah. Jets, Jets and Jets 19 months and when he's when he's four. But yeah, it's hard work, man, but it's class. It's absolutely class. If I never had the kids, I don't know what I'd be doing, man. I'd be laying in a ditch somewhere or under the ground <laughs> without a doubt. Brilliant. Well, that's, that's me done, Kyle. Is there anything you would like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming up? No, I'm cool. Um, just just got these outdoors coming out. So hopefully we just want to just play as much wee shows as we can because we're trying to get this, trying to get the a good a good chart position to get back at our, back to our best. Um, but it's looking good, man. The pre-sales are good. So everyone just go and get their album, man. Just going to love it. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. All right, well, all the best, and I wish you all the best with the album, and hopefully I'll get over to Belfast on tour at some stage. Yeah, I think they're going to get announced. Uh, Be- Belfast and Dublin's going to get announced. Brilliant. These are shout bands for a beer or whatever. Oh, definitely will. Definitely will. Look forward to that, Kyle. Cheers, mate. Right, so, mate. Cheers, man. I'll see you in a bit. Take it easy. Bye-bye. You too, man.